All right, so this session is oral surgery. This is chapter 18. Uh, that means we are getting closer to the finish point. Oral mastofacial surgery is very, it's not as complicated as compared to ENT. Most ENT surgical technologies are very competent in oral mastofacial surgery. So this is how it works. Um, if you are an ENT tech, you can scrub oral mastofacial surgery procedure easily without any problem. If you can scrub ENT and oral mastofacial surgery, you will be uh, you pretty much on your way in scrubbing uh, orthopedic cases like you know total hips, total joints, and everything else because they, in those instrumentations they are it's not too far apart as compared to cardiothoracic and you know neuro and other things like that but it kind of set the, uh, the stage for you for bigger procedure and that's what we'll be looking at uh, today since we already did ENT we'll focus on oral mastofacial surgery a little bit uh, don't be don't freak out it's not it's really not that bad okay so let's see how best we can take a look at this one so uh, again, after everything else we'll talk about, uh, everything we're talking in this chapter, you should be able to recognize the anatomy re uh, relevant to specific procedures in oral and mastofacial surgery. Uh, we'll talk about those different anatomy, just like ENT. One of the things that you realize on the CSC exam is that majority of the question will come from uh, anatomy and physiology. I think about six, six questions is anatomy and physiology. And you have the opportunity to make this easy, you know, by studying your AMP in doing your case studies, you know, like we're doing um, oral masturbation surgery and we'll be dealing with the head, you know. If you know the anatomy of those things medically, not using like layman terms, you should be fine. We did ENT not too long ago. If you know the anatomy of the ear, which one is the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear? Where will you find those strategic locations, uh, the cochlear implant, uh, the stapes, the anchors? Where you see those different uh, parts located it makes it a little bit easier for you. Now, we have the uh, anatomy of the oral mastofacial surgery procedure. We should be able to summarize the pathology uh, that normally prompts oral and mastofacial surgery and the related terminology that's involved in it. There are a lot of illnesses that occur in there. There are a lot of diseases that cause all the different problems, but this will help us to identify and also understand, say, hey, this is what's going on, this is what we can do to, to fix some of those things. Uh, we should be able to determine special preoperative diagnostic procedures, tests pertaining to oral and mastofacial surgery. In every case that we do, we have to understand where the patient came from or where the patient got uh, their illness from. We have to understand their uh, history and physical. Those things help the surgeon decide what to do, what kind of treatment plan to put the patient on, whether it will be direct observation, whether it will be lab work, whether it will be x-ray to identify some of the things, or whether it will be like a 3, 3D autograph, you know, a 3D printing to take a look and say, well, this is what we have, this is what we can do to fix, this is what we have identified. All those things will be done in a pre-operative phase when the patient comes in. Now, this same chapter should be able, by the time we're done, we should be able to determine special pre-operative preparation procedures related to oral masturbation. So what are things that will be done before the surgery for us to be prepared for that patient to come in? Indicate the names and uses of oral and masturbation instruments, their supplies, and the medications that are being used. We just look at ENT. One of the most common medications that you saw in uh, ENT was for cocaine, right? That's the most common one. Now, I'm not saying there are, there are not that many medications that can be used in it, but the most common one that you just saw was cocaine. Then we look at oral mastofacial surgery. What would be the most common medication that you see in oral mastofacial surgery we're identifying? And then we'll get into cardiothoracic probably tomorrow or some other time, uh, Tuesday or Wednesday you will see what medication is more common in, uh, how you call it, in cardiothoracic, like the, uh, the heparin medication, right? And the other thing we should be able to do is indicate the names and uses of special equipment that we normally use for oral and mastofacial surgery. Every single procedure that we do, the 150 common or most commonly used instrument that's used, you should already know. 
this one will just focus on special uh, instrument that uh, can be used in uh, OMFS. I don't think any of you have done oral surgery yet, right? One of you did. I don't know who. No, I haven't. Okay. Uh, I think Hannah did oil. Yeah, I did. Oral. Okay. All right. I mean, it's not a, it's not a fun place to be. Most people don't like oral surgery, just like me not liking GYN. Okay. Um, but if you get into it, you got to do some cool stuff. You know, imagine taking out a uh, tooth for a patient on a supervision of the doctors. You know, uh, those are some of the cool things. Imagine you're still closing for the your surgeon if they actually trust you or if you want to extend into the PA realm of things. So it, it's a little bit different. Should be able to determine the intraoperative preparation of the patient undergoing oral mastication procedure. You should be able to summarize the surgical steps of oral, um, of oral or mastification procedure. And we should also be able to assess any specific durations related to the preoperative or postoperative and uh, care of surgical patients. So we'll take a look at some of those things as we continue to dive in uh, this chapter. This chapter is not as long as. Um, E&E, so we should be done fairly quickly. But again, it's not about us being done, it's about you understanding the information that's in here. Now, preoperative factor for patient undergoing oral surgery. One of the things, and this one happens for every patient, it's not just for oral surgery. Every patient going for surgery, one of the things they confuse, uh, one of the main things they'll be afraid of is anest uh, their anesthetic outcomes. What if I go under? I go for uh, for general anesthesia and I don't wake up. You know, they, they, they sometimes they're so scared of these things. Like, what if I go for the surgery? And, you know, I'm fine now, but if I go and for some reason I get overdose of medication, I don't wake up for anesthesia. They get afraid. The other thing to be afraid of is the pain level. You know, if they go and they be like, oh well, there will be pain associated with it. And one of the things you should not be telling your patient, I hope you don't, is don't tell a patient, say, oh, we'll get you pain medication, you'll be fine. No, mm -mm. There are things without pain medication. If you take your pain medication on time, on schedule, you will be kind of like sort of okay, but it's not going to alleviate all the pain. There will still be some pain and discomfort at some point. When the old medication is wearing up and new one kicking in, within that period, something will happen. You know, even with that pain medication on board, sometimes the medication will not you know, cover that time period, so there will be some pain involved into it. Be honest with the patient. We'll give you some pain medication to help reduce the pain. But again, these are some of the things that come with surgery. There will always be discomfort. Let them know. So they're not making, you know, unwanted decision, getting mad at you for telling them the incorrect information. Uh, special needs, uh, especially when it comes down to children. Children normally have a big problem with this. So in most cases, what we do with these patients that are coming in like children, uh, that will be afraid of anesthesia or associated anesthesia with death. We try to talk to them, calm them down as much as we can. In most cases, they will bring into the operating room their favorite toy. Their parents will bring them in a bag. Uh, as soon as they get the IV in and kind of getting ready to put them to sleep, they'll ask the parents to leave the room. But the parents will be in there just to kind of hold their hands and everything else to, to do most of the things. Patient already in the hospital for other concerns, example, uh, Transplant recipients, we can take a look at those things, those are special needs we have to look at and say, well, how best we can help this patient to kind of reduce the stress level. You know, because getting a transplant is not easy. It's a long waiting list. But now that long waiting list, someone comes in, they have to go through all kinds of medication. They got to take all this and they get their body ready so that their body can reject those things. We'll try to calm the nerve down a little bit so they don't be afraid. Now, for these patients, we want to make sure we interview these patients. And then their chart should be examined. The reason why we're doing that, the reason why hospitals want to do that is to reduce uh, wrong size surgery. You know, because there are a lot of different things that can happen. We could perform wrong size surgery or we could perform the surgery on the wrong patient. We want to make sure we can fully identify who that patient is. And that patient that's actually sitting in the office is a patient that needs that surgery done. And we can make all the system. We also want to make sure that we go over everything that patient do understand what we're about to do, what our options are, and what are other alternatives for them to follow if they have to. 
Now, we have to be able to provide specific, uh, in specific regards to history and fiscal, MPO, status, allergies, diagnostic, and laboratory results. We want to make sure when we're going through this chart, we ask the patient these questions. You know, let's review that history one more time. Let's see what fiscal has really been doing. If someone wants to come in for gastric bypass surgery, they're supposed to be on a nutritional regimen. They're supposed to be doing some type of exercise. So we want to review that chart to make sure they've been doing the exercise. Because if you're not doing the exercise, why are you having gastric bypass surgery for in the first place? There's no need. If you're coming for that surgery, we also want to make sure that you follow the, 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 the instructions we gave you. Don't eat or drink after midnight. You know, we've got to check that MPO side because this is a safety issue. If that patient eats or drink anything, they could probably choke on that food and we try to avoid it. We want to evaluate their allergies reaction. What are things that they are allergic to so we can make sure we don't have in the operating room. Look at the diagnostic uh, step. The laboratory that it did, let's look at it. What's the result shows? Is the result stay the same as what it was before then? We want to also help provide accurate efficient assistance to the patient. These things are things that we normally do in the operating room before. I mean, this will be done to the pre operating area before the patient can come back. And this is something that is nurses, the doctors will be doing. For us, surgical tech, we sit in the back setting up. Now, when the patient comes in, when they're doing that timeout, that's our place for us to verify the patient information because what was written on the schedule versus what actually written in the chart, if those two things does not match, now you have to raise concern, be like, hey, something is not right here. We'll have to change some things. I don't think this is the right patient. Or this or not sounds like the patient we're doing, you know. So it will be easy for you to speak up. Now, x-ray should be available, especially for uh, oral mastification surgery when we're doing extraction. We want to make sure the x-ray is displaced because what normally happens, one of the most common things that happens is uh, the surgeon or the resident will actually extract the wrong tooth. And we don't want to have that. So if you displace that x-ray and the x-ray should have markings on it that say, hey, this is the tool we're trying to take out. This is the location of it. And we'll mark it down and then it can continue from there. If for some reason that information is not available, there should be an electronic uh, copy somewhere. If you don't have a printer, there should be an electronic copy. And that electronic copy is not a little hospital policy. In some hospital, they will not do that surgery until they can have an x-ray to displace in the room before they can do it. Now, there should always be consultation between surgeons in advance of the procedure that will help uh, the team prepare for it. So if, for you guys, you guys are students, but once you graduate the program, you become a staff to your hospital, you will know exactly who the surgeon is, you know what they like and what they dislike. You know, uh, their preference card should be what we should be using to pull their, their, their stuff. And then in the morning, we just confirm with them, hey, this is what you have on your preference card. Do you need anything different that we can add on? So at least the surgery can move smoothly. And if they say, no, everything is good, then you're fine, you're right on track. Patient with possible mass of facial defects, like um, I will probably pull a picture up and show you guys to see some of those uh, defects, well, one of the things that we talk about in ENT, uh, you know, it can also be uh, performed, we can also do that surgery or mass facial surgery. Physical examination should be done carefully. Uh, we should look at different type of imaging as far as uh, what will be a, a CT, X-ray, what will be an MRI, or what will be a combined X-ray, or panoramic X-ray. We'll take a look at those things and see exactly what's going on now. You don't have to have a degree in reading x-ray to understand it. Just look at it and make sure what they're talking about actually makes sense to you. And if you don't ask questions, because you'll be the subject of tech. Something happened in that room, they will call you to ask you questions. And you have to answer those questions as you see. Now, some of the frame or the x-ray that we normally take, suspected type of fracture details the type of different view to be taken. The water's view. That would be one of the ones that you'll be seeing more common. The car wear view. Remember the car wear view? When we talk about the car wear uh, incision in uh, ENT, it's the same type of view. Oh, well, yes, it's true. Yeah, and then you have... Like, like right above the teeth. What's the, that? It was the one right above the teeth on the dorsal side. Or on the, the one right above the teeth, right? Yes, the one that you saw, they had a, a car wear retractor in there under the cheek, you know, making that incision. That's the same thing here with the car wear. Yeah. Just taking a panoramic, uh, panoramic view to take a look at the whole thing. You have a basal view, a panoramic view, and a lateral facial view. 
those are some of the experts that will be in the operating room to help the uh, surgical team understand exactly what will be going on uh, with the patient or for the patient. CT scan will probably be able to show the high part of my mid maxillary and the mid operatory area. MRI will probably do a little bit better. But if you look at this type of x ray, water view, color view, lateral facial view, those ones will give you details, location on where you really want to look. And CT scans and MRI will give you like a generalized area. So, okay, well, this is a picture of the head and neck area, pretty much, right? You want to see a detail. This is where you'll go to take a look at it by taking these different type of x ray. And the other things you'll also see uh, 3D imaging will also be very good. You know, I can work on the Alright, so you see some of those things to be working so far when it comes to the 3D imaging. Uh, the anatomy normally interfere with the viewing, can be eliminated before and after the models can be generated. So the 3D imaging gave you a hands on type of approach. You can actually see it before the computer print it out for you, and then you can take a different look at a uh, different approach on how you will make your surgical incision as a surgeon. Routine is some uh, instruments and equipment and supplies. Some of those things that you probably need in the operating room for this type of surgery will be uh, will be found on page 703, your dental and plastic instrument set, moth prop, yank cover, seven knife handle, needle holder. Those are all something that's more common, but another thing that's different is my gill. Uh, my gill will be a little bit different for you. That's something new. Uh, the optional faucet that's new to you. Uh, you also see a Minnesota retractor. Minnesota muff props and plastic chip retractor. I don't think those things are new. I think those are things you have seen before. And you will see it in um, table 18.1. And that's the same thing that you found on page 703. Not every instrument from East Year will be used. Okay, so uh, some hospital, what they do, they try to reduce the amount of instruments that comes in the instrument set. Other uh, hospitals just say, well, just bring it because all the surgeons can come out to an agreement. You have newer generation of surgeon, you have older generation of surgeon, and some of the older generation like to use instruments that are no longer existing, and new generation wants to use new technology. So it's, it's weird. But when we're doing tooth extraction, one of the things that we try to take a look at, um, again, this is very easy. Patient comes in, patient will be in a supine position, will have the x-ray displays in the room. Uh, put the patient down. Uh, this procedure can be done under local anesthetic. It could be done on a moderate or conscious sedation, or it could be done on a general, uh, general anesthesia. But if we're doing it in the operating room, especially at a water ring, patient will be in a supine position and they will be on a general sedation. Uh, we will still give them local anesthetic uh, by numbing uh, the local side directly after the goes to sleep. And then we want to make sure that uh, the patient will try to keep it sterile in the room. We know that it's not sterile because we're working with the mucous membrane, but we we'll do our best to keep it sterile. Floss copper will be used to help take x-ray uh, for the x-ray machine. Uh, when you're doing this one again, understand if you have x-ray in the room and you're doing this procedure on a, uh, an ideal location, an ideal condition, you will need to have uh, a protective equipment on you, like uh, some type of lead apron or stand six feet away from the uh, x-ray machine, you know, those are some of the things that you need to do for yourself. Protect yourself with a leg if you stand away six feet away from uh, the x-ray site, so at least you don't get exposed to too much radiation. Use cream or ointment to the lips, and that will help because when they come in, they're doing all those retractor, the uh, Minnesota retractor, the, um, how you call this sort of one, Minnesota, and the sweetheart retractor, we're using the things to do all type of retractor on the, on the leg. You know, so we want to pull something in the lip to actually keep the lip moisture afterwards. So at least they don't have no crack or tear on the lips. Uh, anesthesia socket should be long enough uh, to accommodate the position of the OR table because just like in um, ENT, whereas they switch the patient around, they, move, they relocated the head of the bed, they took that connector and took it down to the foot. That same thing can be done. So that is done. What we can do now is, in most cases, when a patient comes in, the head is all the way closer to anesthesia, especially for ER, EAT and whole mass efficient surgery. Once that patient is intubated, they switch that bed around. The patient feet 
will now go to the anesthesia working area and the patient's head goes 180 degrees from the original point that it was. So we want to make sure that uh, the anesthesia sucker is long enough. Not you per se, but the anesthesia tear when it comes in to change your things that I have to make sure you got a long, they, they do have a longer one. And the anesthesia I just have to ensure that they do have it in there. And if they don't have it, this is where you come in. If they don't have it, you've been working with that surgeon, you know very well the procedure they're about to do. You just verify that, hey, we do need or we are, this procedure will require a longer anesthesia socket. And then you can use that to continue with, with the patient. But once everything is located in the patient in the supine position, we'll have the x-ray displays, patient is prepped and everything else, we will still protect the patient hair by putting it in the wrap. Uh, we'll go ahead and get a muff rinse. Uh, some people use periogar and they clean up the, uh, the patient mouth will, you know, to brush, they just brush it up and suction it up. When they come in, they will put something in the patient's throat. It's a ray text. The ray text will be, uh, they will kind of shrink it up, put in the water, make it moist, and then they'll put it in the patient's throat. They'll put it in there and then leave a little bit hanging out. So sometimes they just wear it in as long as they can see it, that's fine. And what that does is it's supposed to help protect the patient so that whatever tooth they're about to take out, that tooth does not get dislodged into the patient's throat or inside the patient's stomach. It can just stay right where on the, uh, it can stay located on the ratex. At the end, they will take that ratex out. But what you have to be accounted for is, um, you have to let them know when you're putting the throat pack in, you have to voice it out. Throat pack is going in because the ratex is considered a cannibal item. You don't want to lose it. It comes in 10 in the pack. So if you put one in, and you forgot you have one in and you have nine ratex out, of course you have to, you know, take those nine ratex up the field and have a fresh one added up. But now your account will still be up because you still have one into the throat. So you have to let, uh, voice it out that throat pack is going in. And then when you're doing your counting, always account for that one ratex as then it's a ratex staying in the throat. And the moment that ratex comes out, now you can, you know, voice out the throw back is out so you can do your final can and be good to go from there. All right, so that's some of the things that you have will uh, dental tooth extraction. So when our tooth extraction will occur, we'll go in and take, take out the teeth. There'll be a lot of instrumentation that we we'll use, uh, 77, 301, 701, um, east and west, a lot of different instruments that they will use. That procedure now, the uh, wound classification will be a class two clean contamination patients in the superposition. Uh, there will be some hemorrhage that will occur, post-operative surgical site infection. And one of the things we, they will tell the patient is, you know, after the surgery, they will tell them not to suck from straw. Uh, you know, they want to take, have them use, they'll put it on a soft food diet for at least um, 48 hours. And then they shouldn't be sucking from straw because that will definitely prevent the heating process for them. And that's the extraction part of it. Now, general consideration when it comes down to this one, uh, patient will not be able to speak because, again, the face is pretty much numb. Facial imaging still will be in there. We'll have to take a look at it. Uh, as you go on, you look at the surgeon. The surgeon will typically uh, stay at the head of the OR bed. Master facial procedure can be lengthy. Sometimes it will be quick. Uh, sometimes it will take a little bit longer time, so it all depends. They could use hand pieces here, and like we said in uh, ENT, the hand pieces that they will be using, it can either operate on electric power or on what on gas power. It could be the nitrogen power that it can operate on. So for the hand piece. And we never submerge the hand pieces in water. There will be some blood loss, uh, but again for the blood loss, we'll have to measure it and measure it as much as you can. It's not I have not seen an oral massificial surgery case in extraction where we have to give the patient blood, but just measure it just for your own so you can understand how much blood loss. Uh, personnel should be prepared to handle a vital situation concerning airway management because they've been working the airways. So if something comes up, we can be able to get into it real quick and fix that problem. Uh, for the blood loss part, uh, best way to do it is account for your irrigation. And sometimes we weigh the uh, ratex or the last sponges, we weigh them dry and then deduct uh, what we have from a wet ratex or last sponge, and we can determine what we have. But the procedure is very quick and simple. You don't take that long. All right, surgical so said normally prepare carefully by removing gross debris. Maxillary reconstruction usually involves several procedures. Uh, the dura tear may be repaired. 
So for this one, definitely we're not going to the direct tier at all. We ain't getting close to the inner sigma spanner fluid at all. So this is like far, far, far away because it's just a regular tube extraction. Open uh, reduction, one of the things that we'll also be using in that technique often requires the use of internal precision devices. Yeah, we can do this one, we'll start doing some bone graph and other things. But one of the things that we'll use in here is uh, the boom wax. Boom wax is very good to help stop bleeding on bone. That's why we use it. After we take out the tooth, we can also replace, not really replace, but we can fill in that gap by putting a gel foam in there. And that gel foam is supposed to help stop the bleeding. Another thing we can also do is we can also get a, uh, what is this thing called? There's a fluid like, uh, when I think about that, I'll let you know, but we'll put a gel foam into that, into that fluid, and then put it into the surgical site to help stop that bleeding. I just went blank. I will find out what that information is here shortly. Hopefully, people will finish up. Uh, surgical technologies may be expected to fill the role of the surgical assistant. And yes, that will be you probably doing some retracting. And when you're retracting, you have to retract exactly how to tell you. That's why you have to use both hands. One hand is on the surgical feet, the other hand is a passive instrument back and forth. Because you helping the surgeon by being a surgical assistant does not alleviate you from your responsibility as a surgical tech. So you have to be, you know, uh, flexible in working. Uh, lubricated patient's eyes, uh, cornea she will be used and we'll put some lubricating device in there or ordinary in there for the patient eye. Local anesthetic with epinephrine. Again, you see how the medication going now, right? In oral myofascial surgery, the most medication that we we'll use is um, Look at it and it could be marking with epinephrine or lidocaine with epinephrine. Sometimes marking will be by itself or um, lidocaine with epinephrine or buprificine. That's the medication that we most frequently use in oral massive surgery. Whereas in uh, ENT, the medication are most commonly used for swine, cocaine. So you can understand how this medication works. And these things are supposed to help you out when it comes down to the pharmacology part, little by little. All right, moving on. Patient is in a supine position, a head position to provide maximum exposure of uh, operative area may be aligned with other towels. Some don't put the towels in there, control on power equipment must be in the safe mode, especially the hand pieces, because you don't want to put a hand piece on a patient and you already have it on. You know, if something happened, it could start either ripping through the drip or ripping through the patient. We don't want that. Uh, so some other things we'll have to take into consideration. Uh, repair of the mandible mandibular maxillary fractures. There are a lot of different fractures we'll talk about. Uh, one of those fractures will be uh, the different types of blood four fractures. Which one will be the most common one and which one is done. We'll talk about those things here shortly as we go on and get to the next hearing. Now, a rigid fixation by plates and screws. So for this one, meaning for most of the fractures, if a fracture do occur, the best way to reduce those fractures is to do an open reduction internal fixation. Open the patient up, but before we do that, we have to get an X-ray, identify where the fracture is. Once we identify where the fracture is, we open the patient, reduce the fracture, put some plates and screws in, and then do another X-ray and see where that is, and then we leave it. If we, if need be, we'll probably put some bone grafting materials in there. If not, we leave it as that. Now, this is a new one: absorbable implants. Some area has absorbable implants, but this one will be recommended for pediatric patients. Adult patient, not so much, but pediatric want to do our best. Now, titanium is the most often uh, place I normally use, place in schools I use, but absorbable can use it for pediatric to get the stay going. Replacement of an arch bar. So this arch bar is almost like having the braces in your mouth, right? We know we have 32 teeth, um, you know, 16, 16. So what we do is when we cut the arch bar, we want to cut the arch bar to be 16, uh, 16 bar with total, you know, one up, one down, put an ash bar in. This ash bar is supposed to help reduce that fracture before we start opening the patient to actually put the place and screws in. That's the function of the ash bar. When we're doing these ones, we need some wires, we need some wire drivers and some wire cutting. And the wire all depends, it can be anywhere from 24, 26, 28, all depends the size that the surgeon actually wants. We can use a rubber band too if we need to. I will See if I can, yeah, I'll show you some picture of those arch bars here. Uh, procedure including place screw precision set. You have mandible fracture. You also have orbital flow fractures. 
La 4 1 fracture, La 4 2 and 3 fracture. Okay, we're going to talk about some of those things. So, page 709, talk about arch bar uh, applica uh, application. This one is very simple. Patient comes in, patient had a traumatic injury from a club. You go into a club fight and someone hit them, and now the mandible is jacked up. As you can see on page 710, you realize there is a mandible fracture where you have the forma and the mental area right between there. Uh, they have a, a, a fracture right down there. That fracture, in order for us to fix that, the first thing we will do is we will try to reduce that fracture. We'll do some x ray and see how it is. Patient will be in pain, right? That's okay, that's normal. Pain is fine. Uh, we'll try to reduce the pain. After that, we'll try to reduce the fracture after taking x ray. To reduce the fracture, one of the things that we will do is get a, um, how you call it, uh, ash bar in there. Look at 7 Eleven, you have the Raymond spoon, definitely happens to have a big old fracture in that area to us for, and that fracture is separated. So we'll try to reduce that fracture by putting ash bar in. The ash bar that you'll see, uh, that picture is on 7 13, okay, 7 13. There's the ash bar to put in there. You know, that ash bar is supposed to help reduce it. Don't focus on the one that closing both the mandible and the maxillary together, but focus on the upper and lower bars that's in there. That's the arch bar. To put it in, you need some wire driver that you'll put the arch bar in and actually secure it. Now, this procedure can be done real quick. Right after this procedure is done, we can do it in conjunction with doing the surgery. Well, the wire that we'll be using can be anywhere from 22, 20, uh, 22, 23, 24, and 26 gauge wire that's actually cut into 10 centimeter diameters. That's, those are the wires that we'll be using. Patient goes in, we we'll put those wires and uh, those wires in, we're gonna tie it tight, you know, right it tight and left it loosey. That's how we're gonna twist those things and go in there. That's all we're doing for this patient. The arch bar will actually stay in there until the patient heals, until the fracture is reduced. So it's not coming out anytime soon, sometime four to six weeks, it will stay in there. Uh, patient jaw will pretty much remain immobilized for the entire time, we move up the arch bar will be usually in the office, they'll come back in, you know, we'll put it, do some low kind of study and take, take the arch bar out for them, but it will stay in there. Once that arch bar is placed in, now we can move forward to the plate and screw fixation set of the mandible fracture. Now that's the time we're moving into page uh, 714, where we're gonna go, the patient's already in there, arch bar is on, then we can go open the location, look at the x-ray, open that site, reduce the fracture, identify what the fracture is, reduce it and actually take the plate, whatever plate you want to use, whether it's an L plate, a Y plate, or a Z plate, take that plate, put that plate in that area, use a plate bender, bend it to the comfort level, put it in there and use the screw. Uh, what it will be sub and self-tapping uh, screw, we're gonna use that screw, put it in there to you know, uh, mobilize it. Now, the thing about the screw, the hand piece, the drill, everything else, when we are using it, there's something that we do need to have available for the surgeon. We need to have fluid available, irrigation. The reason why we're irrigating that is to help the patient. The human body temperature is 98.6 degrees. If you're using saw or car and rubbing against one another on the bone, what happens? You're creating more heat. So in order to avoid body temperature from going way above, or in order to avoid that bone from overheating above the 98.6, we apply that water on it to cool it down so the bone cannot die. So you always need to have water in there with you. This one again will be um, class two, clean contaminated. If it's external, you're putting the screws in externally, then that become a class one, but if it's internally, that become class two. Again, the plates and the screw fixations that will stay in that patient for as long as it can be. The only time it will come off unless it starts causing problem. But in an ideal time, four to six weeks, they will evaluate and then decide whether uh, that will come off or not. Uh, 716, page 716 gave you a pretty good picture where you see those different plates in there. Whether it's an orbital flow fracture, a uh, zapper process fracture, or mandible fracture, you see all those fractures in there. You know, all those different plates to help reduce those, those fractures. Now, for upper flow fracture, this one is crazy, it is pricky, it is scary, because that fracture will occur right in the eye socket area. We want to make sure that a patient is stays safe without losing their sight. So this type of incision that will be made for especially upper flow fracture, the incision will be made on the inner eye leg. You know, have the cornea shield over the eye, 
But what we're doing is we're going to go on the inner outlet, and that's the place we will actually make that decision. That's why I say it's scary, because we're all making a decision, have to be very careful so that they don't turn the knife in a different direction. Then we identify the fracture, reduce it, and do everything else, and the patient should be good. Now, this other procedure now, because we're going onto the inner outlet, we're going on the eye, not the eye that's above. If you look at the lower outlet, right, we're going to pull that one out, and then inside the lower outlet, we're making that decision to go into the fracture side. Because we're not going directly through the eye and make this procedure to be a clean procedure, to be a sterile procedure. That's one of the things that's actually good about it. All right, moving on. At some point, when we get into anatomy and physiology, we'll talk about uh, the orbital fluid fracture and start looking at the, uh, the extrinsic muscle of the eye. But for now, we'll leave it as that. Uh, La for one. So we have three different fractures. Uh, those three fractures that you see will be Lafort 1 fracture, uh, and then you have Lafort 2 fracture and Lafort 3 fracture. The most common fracture that will occur is a Lafort 1 fracture. That's the most common one. Lafort 2 and 3, those are just you know, something critical, something advanced, something different. Page 720 gave you a good example of what those different fractures are. If you look at Lafort 1 fracture, that's a fracture that's actually occurred below the nose. Again, remember I told you one, uh, one point uh, in ENT when we're doing, um, uh, how you call this thing, uh, those conches, and a conscious surgery, so when we're trying to fix the tenderness, it can be done in a Lafort fracture, especially Lafort one, because now we have a good location, we have a good view, we have a good access point to actually review, look at it, and actually take it out, or cut it down, or shave it out, or leave it right in. This is the same where now we can even do a set around the plastic because right after that, we break that jaw, the upper jaw one, we break it, we have a good visualization of the inner portion of the nose. So we can do all the set and deviation, the set around the plastic, we can do all the things in there. Now, in a car accident, Lafour one is the most common one. Lafour two fracture, if you look at it, that's a fracture that extends above the nose area. It's half a fracture like that to actually happen, unless, of course, you're involved in uh, GSW uh, to the face or something like that. But for three fracture now, it still remains above the nose, but it also extends towards the, uh, um, the, cheek, uh, the cheekbone or the uh, orbital bone. It actually extends to that area. That's how that picture is. So the most common uh, fracture is a for one fracture. That's what you have to definitely focus your attention on. A Lafort 1 fracture, also called a transverse maxillary, is the most common type of mid facial fracture. The alveolar process of the, uh, of the maxillary is normally horizontally separated from the base of the skull. The upper jaw can be floating free or over, uh, free in the over cavity. That's a Lafort 1 fracture. That's the most common one. So for fracture like this, the first thing we do, patient comes in again, we're going to take those x-ray and everything else, and then we're going to do everything we have to do. Patient comes in, get the patient ready, pre or holding, get the patient in the back. And then while we're doing everything else, the first thing we're doing is putting ash bar in. Now, if this procedure was actually scheduled, if it was a non-traumatic type of procedure, during the pre-operative phase, uh, the surgeons, the resident can take all those different pictures, get a model, everything, especially if the patient had an over buy or under buy. Lafort 1 fracture can actually fix those things. We could throw in a BSS or bilateral split, uh, sagittal split, or That would be the mandible part. That shows that uh, if you look at the mandible, the mandible has been cut at the women's will to be separated. Either the patient, one of the things that will happen is that the patient was trying to bite and the bite was not that good. So we'll go ahead and change some things around. Uh, and one of the things that we'll do to change the things around now is to either make the mandible wider by cutting out and pulling the back wall or making the maxillary area longer by cutting and pulling the outwall to do it. And that's what will be happening in uh, a LAFO 1 with BSSO type of surgery. So that surgery can be performed, but for this one, since we're just focusing on LAFO 1 fracture, we'll go ahead and reduce it by putting ash bar in. After that, we you know, make our incision get our place, put our place in there, screw it back into place, 
and then we're done. We can get the patient to go on to uh, the uh, pre, I mean, the PICU area, and they can rest it until they get ready to get discharged, and they'll have to come back again uh, four to six weeks later, so we can evaluate it in the clinic and see how best they are healing. Uh, I would say procedure like this is a good weight loss, uh, weight loss for our procedure, but again, it's just me because what happened when a patient have that ash bar in, we did a survey that we do a lot for one on them. What we're doing, we're going to pretty much lock the jaw. We're not locking it per se, but we're putting rubber band on it and we're going to restrict them to eat soft food. So for them to eat real food will be a little bit hard. But the downside to it is once the rubber band comes off, yeah, patient can eat whatever they want. And when they start eating now, they can gain more weight that way. So it's a little bit different. Now, you also have LAFO2 and LAFO3 fractures. Everything we did for LAFO1 fracture, we can do the same thing. And for oral massofacial surgery, there's one thing we need to have available in the room. And that thing is an emergency tracheotomy set at all times. We need to have in the room just in case something goes wrong. So the LAFO2 and three fracture, uh, they normally suspend the maxillary arch to stable bones. The suspension wires will be placed through a little hole that will be drilled bilaterally, and pretty much that's how we can do it to fix those things. Uh, kind of suspend those things in there. The same thing we did for LAFO for one, we do the same thing for LAFO for two and LAFO three fracture. And that pretty much take care, takes care of this one. That makes it so easy. Uh, single double jaw surgery that is normally performed with precision, correct jaw alignment. My occlusion, this is what orthogonic surgery is. For orthogonic surgery, before they even decide doing that surgery, that's the time to pull uh, braces in the patient mouth to see if they can fix that occlusion. If it does not work, then we can go to a most drastic measure and that would be the lumbar fracture that we we'll normally uh, try to do. But pretty much, like I was saying, oral surgery is very simple and easy. It's not too really that much to do with oral surgery. It's just very simple. Um, which is good, actually. Uh, if you look at this right here, all right. So this is uh, you have to like open, like open, open. And this one will be down. Once it's down, you have to open it up and try to move it in. And that makes it so. Now uh, let's see. Um, uh, I think I'm good. Hot, you got any? So no, we can't hear you. These are the ash bars here. In recording, we just caught it to fit these areas. This arch bar directly onto the tube that makes it easy. Well, then what do you have? I don't have any more questions. Do you have any? Hard to hear, but. Oh, there you go. What'd you say? You got questions? No, it was, it was hard to hear. Ooh, you have no question. Your gender might be so easy. All right, so pretty much that, that is what we're going to cover today. Um, and oral surgery is pretty much very 